Okay. Okay, so anyway, thanks for coming to the program tonight. We're doing DNA testing for family history research uh, with Katherine Wilson, who's a dynamic genealogy and history lecturer at local, regional, and national events, a full-time researcher and genealogy educator for 20 years. She's the founder and past president of the Virtual Genealogical Society, uh, she's authored The Genealogist's Guide to Grand Rapids, Michigan, as well as The Genealogy on, Faced, on Facebook list, a catalog of over 16,000 genealogy history links on Facebook. So, Catherine, thank you. Welcome. Thanks so much. I'm just going to mute somebody here. If everybody can make sure that you're muted, please. That way we won't get any uh, noise coming in from the feedback. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to give this presentation. It is one of my favorites, so I'm really excited to share this information with everybody. I'm going to turn my camera off right now, and then I'm going to turn it back on when we get to the question and answers portion of the presentation. If you have any questions while I'm going through the presentation, please go ahead and type those into the chat, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So what we're going to do first is share a list of four objectives. Every time I give a presentation, I share an objective slide because I think it helps people if they know exactly what to expect in the approximate one hour that we're gonna to be together. And for this one, we only have four. The first one is to talk about the basic principles of genetic inheritance. And if you took a biology class in high school or college, this is gonna be very basic. And a reminder, we're just gonna do a very brief part of um, an overview of genetic inheritance. The bulk of our presentation is going to talk about the three different types of DNA tests that we can do for genealogy. And it's really important that everybody understand that we are talking about tests that we take for family history. We're not talking about the tests that you might get from a physician's office that takes care of medical issues. This is only DNA tests for genealogy. And we're going to look at what those three different tests are and which companies will offer them. Our third objective is to spend some time looking at the myths and the ethics of DNA testing. And then finally, we're gonna end the presentation by talking very briefly about a third party tool known as GEDmatch.com. GEDmatch is the program that is being used by a lot of investigative genetic genealogists. Um, that is how so many police departments are discovering criminals that have hidden out for a long time. And we're just gonna briefly talk about GEDmatch at the end. So with that, let's get started by talking about how similar every single one of us are. Each of us who are here tonight and everybody in the world, we have 99.9% .9 of identical DNA. And that's pretty remarkable. Regardless of our race, regardless of where we live, we are 99.9% .9 identical in terms of our DNA. So when we take a DNA test for family history, those tests are looking at that remaining one-tenth of a percent of DNA. And what is in that one-tenth percent of the DNA are these things called genetic markers. And when we do the test with the genealogy companies, they are specifically looking at those genetic markers in that 0.1%. It's also helpful if we all understand the difference between a genealogy tree and a genetic tree. When we do genealogy or family history, we build a family tree that looks at relationships. So when we're filling out a family tree, we might choose to put in children that we may have adopted. If we had step parents, we may include those on our family tree. Some people identify with social families rather than biological families. And that all has to do with a genealogy family tree. What makes a genetic tree different is that a genetic tree is only going to identify those people who have biologically contributed to our DNA. And that doesn't in any way diminish the importance of people who might be in our genealogy tree that we do not share DNA with. It's just a way of identifying the differences. So let's set the groundwork by talking about basic principles of genetic inheritance. And again, if you had biology in high school or college, this is gonna be very basic for you. Females have two X chromosomes. And when a female is going to reproduce, she can only pass down an X 
and her egg because she only has two X chromosomes. Whereas males have an X and a Y chromosome. So when a male is going to reproduce, he could pass down either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. So for an example, let's say that we have a female who has passed an egg, and that egg, of course, has her X chromosome because that's all she has. And that egg gets fertilized with a male sperm, and that has an X chromosome. Remember, a male can pass either an X or a Y. But in this example, let's say that he passes down an X chromosome. We then will have a female baby that is born from that because females have two X chromosomes. The second example would be, again, a female passing down her X chromosome in her egg, being fertilized with a male sperm that this time has a Y chromosome in it. That is going to produce a male fetus. Anytime we have an X and a Y chromosome, we know that that is going to produce a male. We're going to come back to a chart that looks like this a few times throughout the presentation. And when we do, I would like to imagine that you are one of those people at the bottom. So if you are a male, imagine that you are that square at the bottom left that says brother. If you are a female, imagine that you are that round circle at the bottom that says sister. Every time we come back to this presentation, I would like it if you can identify with it by figuring out where you are immediately. Again, all the males down there at the bottom, that square that's blue and purple, all the women in the circles where it says sister. When we continue to talk about genetic inheritance, it's helpful to know that we have all inherited 50% of our DNA from our biological mother, and we have inherited 50% of our DNA from our biological father. Somebody needs to please make sure that you, you're muted, if everybody can take a moment and make sure that you're muted so we don't get any background noise. Because we know that we got 50% of our DNA from our mother and 50% from our father, then we can go back one more generation and say that 25% of our DNA came from our maternal grandmother, 25% came from our maternal grandfather, 25% from our paternal grandmother, and the remaining 25% from our paternal grandfather. So that makes up the 100% DNA of what we have. This is an example of a screenshot of Ancestry.com through their DNA portion. I did take a test with Ancestry DNA. I also tested my mom and my dad with Ancestry DNA. And you can see that my father is listed up there at the top and he's labeled father. My mother is right underneath that labeled mother. And you can see that Ancestry is telling us on this Ancestry.com DNA page that I do share 50% of my DNA with my father and 50% with my mother, exactly what we would expect. When we are talking about DNA, it's also helpful to know about autosomal DNA. You'll sometimes see this abbreviated with a lowercase at in the capital DNA. Autosomal DNA is not something that comes from the sex determining chromosomes. Remember I said if we have a male who passes down a Y chromosome with the female's X, then we're going to get a male baby. But that is, has to do with sex determining chromosomes. Autosomal DNA does not come from those sex determining chromosomes. Autosomal DNA is something that's going to get diluted by 50% every time we reproduce. So if I have a baby, that baby is going to have 50% of my DNA. That baby has a baby, you're going to have 25% of my DNA. And that's called recombination. That's not something that you necessarily need to remember when we're talking about beginning DNA. But certainly if you are somebody that ends up taking a couple of different DNA tests for genealogy, that is a term that you'll come across. So autosomal DNA gets diluted by 50% with each generation, and that's known as recombination. You might also not know that siblings inherit different portions of their parents' DNA. So my sister has also taken a DNA test through Ancestry.com, and she also has 50% of our DNA is from my mother, 50% of her DNA is from our father, but we don't necessarily have the same portions of the DNA. The reason I bring that up is because for family history, it can be very helpful to have your siblings take a test to help you discover more about your family tree. 
We're going to talk more about that in a little bit, but before we do, let's shift our focus into a discussion about the types of DNA tests that we will take for genealogy. Again, not those that would be administered at a medical facility for medical purposes, just those that we take for genealogy. The first one that we're going to talk about is Y DNA tests. The second one that we'll look at is called mtDNA, which stands for mitochondrial DNA tests. And the third one is an autosomal DNA test, which again, you'll see abbreviated with a lower AT, capital DNA. And we're gonna start by talking about the Y DNA test. Because we know that only men have a Y chromosome, remember women only have an X, whereas men have an X and a Y, the Y DNA test can only be taken by men. They're the only ones that have the Y chromosome. That Y chromosome is going to get passed through the paternal line. So when we take a Y DNA test, when a male takes that Y DNA test, it is going to trace his direct lineage of his father's, 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 father's line going all the way back. So what do we do if we are female? and we want to trace the direct lineage of our fathers, 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 fathers. Well, we can't take a Y DNA test as females. We don't have a Y chromosome, but if we have a brother who is living, we can ask our brother to take the test. If our father is still living, we can ask him to take a test. Perhaps we have an uncle on our father's side who's still living that can take the test. Or maybe an uncle on our father's side also had a son he could take the test. So as women, we aren't, you know, out of luck. We can still trace our father's, 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 father's line by finding the next available male in our ancestral line. You'll remember that we talked about recombination and how autosomal DNA is diluted by 50% with every generation. What's really fascinating about the Y chromosome is that it barely mutates at all. So every time it gets passed down through the generations, there are very, very few changes known as mutations. Why would we take a Y DNA test? Well, I had my husband take a Y DNA test because in general, in Western cultures, the surname follows the male's lineage. So my husband received his surname from his father. His father received his surname from his father and going back. So I encouraged my husband to take a Y DNA test so I could trace that surname origin. I also did the same with my father. I asked him to take a Y DNA test so I could trace my maiden name going back through the generations. What you'll hear a lot of if you watch TV or listen to the radio, you'll hear a lot of commercials from Ancestry.com where they talk about people uncovering their ethnicity. How much percent German are they? How much percent Irish are they? And a Y DNA test can be helpful in uncovering those ethnicities, but it's important to know that those are estimated ethnicities. That's not the hard science. We'll talk a little bit more about ethnicities towards the middle of the presentation. Here is that chart again that I shared right at the beginning. And I said that if you are a male in the audience, then you will look at this and imagine that you are that square at the bottom that says brother. And we can see what the Y DNA test is going to test. It's going to test his father's, 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 father's line going way back hundreds and hundreds of years. The next test that we're going to talk about is the mitochondrial DNA test. You will sometimes see that abbreviated with a lowercase mt. A mitochondria is found in every single cell of both males and females. And because of that, that means that men or women can take the mitochondrial DNA test. Unlike the Y DNA test, which can only be taken by men, both males and females can take the mitochondrial DNA test. However, it's a little bit similar to the Y DNA test in that it's only going to trace the direct lineage of your mother's, 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 mother's line going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So again, the Y DNA test only taken by males traces the male's father's, 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 father's line. The mitochondrial test taken by males or females will only trace the direct lineage of our mother's, 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 mother's line. 
just like I said that the Y DNA has very little mutation as it progresses through the generation, the same is true for mitochondrial DNA. There are very few mutations happening as it passes through the generations. The mitochondrial DNA test can be incredibly helpful when two females descend from what we think is the same great, great, great grandmother. And we want to do a DNA test to make sure that those two females do indeed descend from the same great, great, great grandmother. It's an excellent test for solving a mystery with regards to parentage of the female. Here is that line again, that uh, chart that I shared right at the beginning. If we are male, we are imagining that we are that square at the bottom that says brother. If we're female, we're imagining that we are that circle that says sister. And when we take a mitochondrial DNA test, it is only going to trace our mother's, 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 mother's line going way back hundreds of generations. The third and final test that we're going to talk about is the one called autosomal DNA. And again, every cell in the male and female body has a nucleus and in that nucleus, there are these things called autosomes. And because both males and females have autosomes, that means that both males and females can take an autosomal DNA test. It's not restricted by gender. When we get an autosomal DNA test, it's going to look at the non-sex determining chromosomes within our cells. If we think back to how we started the presentation, we talked about women only having X chromosomes, men have X and a Y chromosome. And again, those are sex determining chromosomes. That's not what an autosomal DNA test is going to look at. When we remember the two tests that we talked about previously, it's most important that at the end of the presentation, you remember that the Y DNA test can only be taken by men. The mitochondrial DNA test can be taken by men and women. Both of those do examine the sex-determining chromosomes. The autosomal DNA test, the third and final one, could be taken by male and female, and it is looking at the non-sex-determining chromosomes of our cells. An autosomal DNA test can also help in uncovering estimated ethnicities. But again, those are estimated. It's not hard science. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we will talk more about ethnicities towards the middle of the presentation. Autosomal DNA tests are by far the most common DNA tests that people are taking in genealogy. It's the test that Ancestry.com sells. It's the test that MyHeritage.com sells. It is the most common and people are using it because an autosomal DNA test can trace back approximately seven generations from us. That means all the way up to our fourth great grandparent or what we also would call a great, 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 great grandparent. That's tracing back really, really far. How far? Well, this is a fan chart. This is a fan chart that has me in the middle. You can see that yellow square in the middle. I am Catherine. If I go straight up from my name on the left side of the fan is all of my dad's ancestors. On the right side is all of my mom's ancestors. And the fourth great grandparent would be that final column around the top, the very top arc. If we look at the very top arc, we can see that I have filled this in with quite a lot of names on my mother's side, but I haven't filled in as many on my dad's side. And the reason for that is that my dad descends from German ancestry. And people in Germany are not really eager to take a DNA test. They feel like it infringes on their privacy. So I haven't been able to fill in as many lines on my father's side because of that. Whereas on my mother's side, she descends mostly from people from England. And England doesn't have those same concerns that the people in Germany have. So I have been able to use DNA test to fill in my chart here, my genealogy chart, by combining my results with documentary evidence. So now that we've talked about the three DNA tests, Y DNA tests taken by men, mitochondrial DNA tests taken by men and women, and autosomal DNA tests taken by men and women, let's talk about which companies are offering those. Who can you buy those tests from? And again, I do want to reiterate multiple times that we are only talking about genealogy or family history 
DNA test. We aren't talking about those DNA tests that, for example, a woman might get at her doctor's office when she's pregnant to determine whether the fetus might have any abnormalities. We're only talking about the genealogy ones. Ancestry.com is by far the most popular company offering the DNA tests. There's another company called 23andMe that you may have seen commercials for or advertisements online. Many of the people who have tested with 23andMe did not initially take the test because they hoped to discover more about their family history. Most people who took a 23andMe test did so because they wanted to get medical information. And we will talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. The third company is called FamilyTreeDNA.com, and they are only selling their kits really to people who are interested in genealogy. We don't find other people buying tests from Family Tree DNA for any other reason. FamilyTreeDNA.com doesn't offer any sort of medical test, so we're only going to connect with people whose DNA we match because they're interested in finding distant relatives. The same is true with MyHeritage.com. They have, MyHeritage.com has started to add sort of like a side business where they're letting people get some medical information by taking a DNA test, but we'll talk about what the limitations are with that a little bit later in the presentation. And then finally, LivingDNA.com. So I have listed the companies here in the order of popularity. The ones that have the most numbers of testers, of course, are with Ancestry. The one that has the lowest number of testers is with livingdna.com. On your handout, everybody should have received a handout for this presentation. It was probably emailed to you. If you don't have that, I'm sure you can get that from the librarian after the presentation. On the handout, you will see that I have given you information about what are the types of tests offered by each company. In a nutshell, Family Tree DNA is the only company that is currently offering Y DNA testing and mitochondrial DNA testing. It does also offer autosomal DNA testing. That's the one that can help us trace all the way up to our fourth great grandparent. And that's what all of the other companies are selling. In general, the cost of the test is going to be about somewhere between $50 to $100 for an autosomal DNA test. I've given you the exact figures on your handout, but what's helpful to know is that there are sales that are being offered all the time by these companies. I don't have any relationship with these companies where nobody pays me to say anything about them, but I do know as a family historian, as a genealogist, as someone who's very interested in buying these DNA tests so I can test more family members, I do know that there are times that are better to buy these tests than other times because of these incredible discounts that are always being offered. For example, coming up next month on April 25th is National DNA Day. And that's pretty amusing to think that here in our country, we have a National DNA Day. But what's really fantastic about National DNA Day leading up to April 25th and on April 25th, most of these companies are going to offer their DNA tests for up to 50% off. We also see a lot of sales for Mother's Day and Father's Day. And as you can imagine, Family Tree DNA, the only one that offers mitochondrial and Y DNA testing, they will, of course, offer discounts on a mitochondrial DNA test for Mother's Day. They offer a discount on the Y DNA test on Father's Day. And all of the other companies that are selling the autosomal DNA test, they also offer Mother's Day and Father's Day discounts. The day after Thanksgiving, known as Black Friday, is also a time that all of these companies put them up for sale, and Christmas as well. Also included on your handout is how each of these companies are going to collect your DNA sample. There are two ways of collecting your DNA sample. One way is to send you a test tube, and then they will ask you to spit into the test tube so that it gathers up your saliva. Another way to collect it is by sending you sort of something that looks a little bit like a brush. It's like a really tiny brush. And you put that brush inside your cheek and you scrape the side of your cheek to pull up cheek cells. And then you put that brush into the test tube and you send that in. 
Why is that important for us? Well, there are some people who have a hard time generating a lot of saliva. As we get older, it becomes a little bit more difficult to generate saliva. So if you are somebody that you know has a difficult time generating enough saliva, enough to fill a small test tube, then you might want to take a test with the company that allows you to scrape your cheek cells. That is a little bit easier to do. Also included on your handout is an up-to-date number of testers that each company has in their database. And that's important for us because if we're taking a DNA test for family history, then the higher the number of testers, the greater the likelihood that we're going to match with living distant relatives. Also on the handout, it explains how you can contact the matches. Is it a company that will only allow you to press a button on their website that says contact your match? Or is it a company that will show you your match's email address so you can email them directly? That information is listed on your handout. And then it also has on the handout information about whether you can take a DNA test with one company. And if you are going to take a DNA test with one company, it's probably best to do it with Ancestry because they have the largest number of testers. You can then download your raw data and then upload the raw data to another company without having to pay the full price for another DNA test. It is very helpful to test with all of the companies because you will pair up with different matches conceivably, and it can be helpful to pair up with the ones that took a MyHeritage test, but maybe they didn't take an Ancestry test, but you don't want to have to pay a full price for each of those tests. So on your handout, you can get information about which company will allow you to download the raw data from one company and upload it to another. And then also included on the handout is something called an accuracy rating. So I have mentioned a couple times already in this presentation that these companies are gonna give us our ethnicity estimates. What percentage of German does it think we are? What percentage of French? What percentage of Ireland? Uh, what percentage of African? It is always important to remember that these are estimates. It's not hard science, but these companies have been rated by an organization called the International Society of Genetic Genealogists. And that accuracy rating for each company is also listed on your handout. We're gonna spend the next part of our presentation talking about some of the myths that are surrounding DNA testing. And the first myth is the people who say genetic genealogy is just for fun. Taking a DNA test is just for fun. That actually is a myth because genetic genealogy, taking a DNA test, is another piece of evidence. When we do genealogy, family history, we are looking at evidence to prove parentage. And DNA testing is another piece of evidence. It's just as important, just as valid as a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, or a death certificate. Another myth surrounding genetic genealogy is this idea that you can take a DNA test and they're going to provide you with your whole family tree. None of the companies are doing that yet. I wouldn't be surprised if in my lifetime something a little bit like that might come around, but it's not happening yet. And I certainly don't see it happening in the next 10 to 15 years. When you take a DNA test, what you're going to get is a list of your matches. Remember how I opened up the presentation? 99.9% .9 of our DNA is identical to one another, regardless of our race, regardless of where we live. 99.9% .9 is identical. It's that remaining 0.1% that is going to be analyzed when we take a DNA test. And the DNA test results are going to give us our matches. So then we look at the information about the matches and we compare it with documentary evidence that we have so that we can confirm the relationship as provided to by the company. Another myth that I hear quite frequently from people is that DNA testing won't be of any help because somebody's parents and grandparents are all dead. And that is a myth. DNA testing actually will help a lot because DNA matches are going to be the descendants of your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, all the way up to your great, 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 great grandparents. 
and it is highly unlikely that all of your ancestors were only children. It is much more likely that your ancestors had multiple siblings, and the DNA matches are going to be the descendants of all of those siblings. Here again is that same chart that we've been looking at so far. We looked at the left side of the chart following the blue squares when we talked about Y DNA testing. We looked at the right side of the chest, the chart here with the purple circles when we talked about mitochondrial DNA testing. But autosomal DNA testing is going to cover all of them who are in the middle as well as the ones that are on the outside. And a reminder again that it is very unlikely that your great-great-grandparent, your great-great-great-grandparent was an only child. What we see on this chart are our direct ancestors, the people who contributed DNA to us. But many of them probably had multiple siblings, and those siblings also had descendants. And that's who we're matching with when we take a DNA test. Myth number four is that the company is going to tell you the actual relationship to your matches. And that is definitely a myth because the companies are going to tell you that you are probably a first to second cousin. You're probably a third to fourth cousin. They will not tell you if this is a half relationship. Let's imagine that we had a great grandparent who had two marriages. They had some children with the first marriage, some other children with the second marriage. That will result in some half relationships. Somebody will have a half sibling or a half aunt, half uncle. The companies also will not tell us the information about a removed relationship. That's when we say something like a first cousin once removed, one generation later, or a first cousin twice removed, two generations later. So what we do in these instances is when we get the match relationships from the testing company, we actually look for the number of centimorgans. Centimorgans is just a unit of measurement. It's sort of like when we think about centimeter. A centimeter is a unit of measurement that looks at distance. A centimorgan is a unit of measurement that looks at how closely we match our DNA matches. When we analyze the number of centimorgans, and then we also do investigative work, looking at documentary evidence, that's how we figure out what an exact relationship is. As an example, let's look again at my screenshot here from my test with Ancestry.com. We can see up at the top left, we have my father. It shows that he there is a parent-child relationship between me and him because I share 50% of my DNA with him. We see that my mother is listed right underneath that. We also have a parent-child relationship because I share 50% of my DNA with her. And then I have a full sibling, my sister. And it says that we share approximately 45 to 52% of our DNA, which makes sense because we inherited different portions of the DNA from our parents. But let's look at another number in here. When we look at my match with my father, it says that he and I share 3,474 centimorgans of DNA. If we look at my sister, I only share 2,540 centimeter centimorgans with her, and that's what we would expect. That would be a number that would indicate a full sibling. On the right-hand side, Ancestry told me that those three names were considered close family. The top one for Sherry says that she's a close family or a first cousin. And then the next two, Barbara and Shirley, say that they are first to second cousins. Well, which are they? Are they first cousins? Are they second cousins? Are they first cousins once removed? That's where we take a look at the number of centimorgans. We can see that this person here, Sherry, I share 1,847 centimorgans with her on my mother's side. Barbara, I share 1,240 centimorgans on my mother's side. Whoops, let me go back here. What's really interesting about this is the top one that says, Sherry, she is my aunt. She is my mother's sister. The second one, Barbara, is my first cousin. She is my mother's sister's daughter. So we always look at those centimorgans so that we can correctly identify what the relationship was. 
Ancestry said that Sherry is a close family to a first cousin, but she's not. She's an aunt. It says that Barbara is a first or a second cousin. And by looking at the number of centimorgans, I can determine that she is indeed a first cousin, not a second cousin. There was a project that was started quite a number of years ago by a man named Blaine Bettinger. Blaine Bettinger is a renowned genetic genealogist in the community. He started this project called the Shared Centimorgans Project. I have included the link to the Shared Centimorgans Project in your handout, but I would also like to share a screenshot with you here. This is what that link will look like. When you click the link and you visit the website, this is what the Shared Centimorgan Project looks like. And what you will do is if you take a DNA test, you will find yourself on the Shared Centimorgan Project, and we are right there in the middle in white. And then you will look to see what the average number of centimorgans is in these relationships. On average, if I have an aunt or an uncle, on average, I will share 1,741 centimorgans with them. But you see that there's another line of numbers right beneath it. That is the lowest number of centimorgans that Blaine Bettinger has been able to determine by taking surveys of people who have done DNA tests. If you have a DNA match that's 1,201, that's a low, little bit lower than what you would expect for an aunt or an uncle, but it still falls within the accepted range. And it could be as high as 2,282. When we have a half sibling, a half sibling would be somebody that shares one of our parents with us, but not both of our parents. Blaine's research has determined that the average number of centimorgans would be 1,759, but it could be as low as 1,160. It could also be as high as 2,436. If we think about what I showed you from the ancestry test with my father, it said that he and I share 3,474 centimorgans, and that fits really closely with what the average is. On average, a parent will have 3,485 centimorgans, so that fits really well. It said that my sister and I shared 2,540 centimorgans, and that again fits pretty close with what the Shared Centimorgan Project has anticipated. And then my first cousin, Shirley, she and I share 1,240, but if we look at the Shared Centimorgan Project, on average, that would be 866. So I share a significant amount more of centimorgans with her than on average, but it still falls within that accepted range up to 1,397. Of course, these figures are only those figures that have been reported to Blaine through his surveys over many, many, many years. So it's a very reliable project. And that's why I've shared the link for it in your handout. When we go back to talking about some of the myths, the fifth math myth is that ethnicity estimates should match what we know and our documented ancestral origin. So for example, I've been doing my genealogy research for Oh my gosh, more than 40 years. I started doing this when I was eight years old. And I know from documentary evidence that my father descends from Germany. I have traced his ancestry going all the way back to Germany to about the 1700s. I know that on my mother's side, her ancestors came from England. I have traced them back all the way to the 1600s. So in general, I would say I'm probably about 50% German, 50% English. But that's not what the DNA testing companies have shown me. When the DNA testing companies give me my um, estimated ethnicities, they're coming up with that information by going to these other countries and putting advertisements in things like a newspaper or maybe on social media. And they're asking people in those countries to please come take a DNA test with them. They will cover the cost. If they know that their second great grandfather, their third great grandfather, their fourth great grandfather has always been in that same country that they are in. So the DNA testing companies are looking at people currently living who have deep roots in their country. They're not, of course, digging up any bodies to do any testing of DNA. And because of this, because we know that people migrated frequently and sometimes in great distances, 
We know that when we get an ethnicity estimate from a company, in general, it's accurate at the continental level. And anytime we get an ethnicity that's under 30%, let's say it says that I'm 26% uh, European Jewish or Ashkenazi Jew. If it's under 30%, it may not necessarily be accurate. It could be accurate, but not necessarily. I do want to, again, remind, of, remind you that we don't get DNA from every single one of our ancestors because of that process called recombination. It's being diluted 50% with every generation when we talk about autosomal DNA. Let's look at a sample here from all of the companies that I have tested with. I tested first with Ancestry.com, and it has told me in its most recent update that I am 33% England and Northwest Europe. And that's exactly what I would think would be both of my parents. My mother's England, my father, Northwest Europe. But it says I'm 33%. I'm actually 23% Eastern Europe and Russia. But I haven't come across any documentary evidence to support that any of my ancestors came from Russia. It says that I'm 18% Swedish and Danish, 9% Scottish, 6% Norway, etc. And then the next one over to the right is from 23andMe. I did also take a test from them, and it said that I'm 56.5% French and German. It combined them. And that makes a lot of sense for what I would think for my dad's side on German. But then it says I'm only 15.7% British and Irish. And I would have expected that to be so much higher based on what I know from documentary evidence. Compare that to FamilyTreeDNA.com, the third one over. It says that I'm 71% England, Wales, and Scotland. Well, what about my dad's side, right? It's, it says East Slavic, 18%. And then we go over to the next one. MyHeritage.com says that Eastern European is 38%, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, 31%. And then all the way over at the far right is the test that I took with Living DNA that gave me a percentage of 35.6% South German, 11.5 Northeast German, 6.6 .6 France. And notice I'm not getting anything here yet for England. It isn't until I get down towards the bottom. South Central England, 6%, South England, 4.6. So this is a huge mess. There, These numbers are all over the place. Because these numbers are all over the place, we know that these are estimates. This is not the hard science. So when I ever have a client that tells me that they wanna take a DNA test to discover what percentage French they are, I try to discourage them. I say, don't take a DNA test if that's your objective because it's not the hard science, it's just an estimate. What we really are taking these DNA tests for is to find the people that we match with. Myth number six is that DNA testing will give us our health information. And it is true that some of these companies that we've talked about will allow us to pay a little bit more money to give us what they call a health report, but the health report is not specific to us. It just says that you are likely or unlikely to develop some sort of a genetic issue. Some people are taking these DNA tests, they're paying extra to get the health reports so that they can find out are they likely or unlikely to develop breast cancer, for example, or prostate cancer. What none of these testing companies are able to do is to take into account what your lifestyle is like. If you are someone that does not smoke, you exercise regularly, you eat healthy, you know that it's probably less likely that you're going to get some of these genetic issues. It's not completely unlikely, but it's less likely. And none of the testing companies are able to take any of that into account. They're strictly looking at ourselves and saying that we are more likely or less likely to get some of, of these genetic issues. Myth number seven, my DNA test will be used to solve a crime. A blanket statement like that is actually a myth. It isn't true that your DNA test necessarily will be used to solve a crime. There is only one company that we've talked about so far, FamilyTreeDNA.com, that actively encourages and allows, and allows law enforcement personnel to upload the DNA that they have from a suspect and try to figure out who they match so that they can figure out who these people are. 
Family Tree DNA is the only company right now that allows that. All of the other companies, Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, Living DNA, um, uh, 23andMe, they are all going to fight any kind of subpoena that comes their way from law enforcement. And they have huge legal departments whose only job is to protect our privacy with regards to the DNA sample that we've submitted. And there's a bunch of factors that are going to go into play when it comes to whether or not Ancestry or 23andMe is actually going to have to comply with the subpoena. So we can't say a blanket statement that my DNA test will be used to solve a crime. There is another company that's called GEDmatch. It's not a testing company. We don't order DNA tests from GEDmatch. It's what's called a third party tool. GEDmatch is a company that a lot of people will take a DNA test with some other company. They'll download their raw data and then they will upload it to GEDmatch as a way of getting more matches. GEDmatch also will allow law enforcement to look at DNA matches compared to a suspect's DNA. What does that mean for you? Well, there are a large number of people who say, if my DNA can be used to catch a criminal, by all means, then use it, right? Use my DNA to put these violent criminals away. And there's other people who say, but wait a minute, we should have informed consent. We should be asked whether or not it's okay for our DNA to be used to solve a crime. And so what all these other companies have done, except for Family Tree DNA and the third-party tool GEDmatch, is that all these other companies are going to protect your DNA. They're going to protect your privacy. Having said that, there are some people who are really, really good at analyzing DNA results. And if you know that your privacy is incredibly important to you and you don't want anybody to be able to match your name to your DNA sample, then I would encourage you not to take a DNA test because there are some people that are so good at analyzing DNA that even if you have used an alias to give a name to your DNA sample, they can still identify who you are. Another myth that I hear frequently is if I take a DNA test, the government is going to have my DNA. And that isn't necessarily true. Again, remember, all of these companies, except for Family Tree DNA, they're going to fight to keep your DNA private. In fact, all of these companies have released legal statements, and I've included those legal statements in your handout, that talks about them protecting your DNA. If you are somebody who has served in the military, the government already has your DNA. There are other instances too where you may have taken a genetic test for something. You may have participated in a study where the study might have had something in fine print that said that your sample or your results of your DNA might be uploaded to the National Institutes of Health or something like that. Any of us who right now take a DNA test with Ancestry, with MyHeritage, with 23andMe, the government doesn't have anything to do with that. They're not going to get our DNA. I wanna end our presentation by talking about some ethics. It's very important that when we think about taking a DNA test that we look at the ethics behind this. And so I would ask you to think about the ethical considerations for a variety of scenarios. I will present to you some scenarios and I would wonder what you think ethically the correct thing to do is. When we think about whether it's ethical to take a DNA test, well, that is up to each of us individually. When I first started doing genealogy with clients, I encouraged all of my clients to take a DNA test, and I no longer do that. I now tell my clients that they need to make an informed decision about whether or not they're going to take a DNA test. There is currently an estimate that there is a 20% chance that if you take a DNA test, you might discover that you have close family that you never knew about. That means that either your mom or your dad had another child that might've been given up for adoption. Maybe they never knew about the child if it was your father. And so you might have a half sibling that you never knew about. You might have a half aunt or a half uncle that you never knew about because maybe one of your grandparents had a child that was never publicly made aware to the rest of the family. There's a 20% chance that that could happen if you take a DNA test. 
there's also a 20% chance that if you take a DNA test, you will discover that one of your family members is not actually biologically related to you. And that doesn't dismiss that person's role in your life by any means, not at all, right? A dad is a dad, a grandpa is a grandpa, but a DNA test will tell you, could tell you there's a 20% likelihood that you might discover that that family member is not biologically related to you. And if those seem like some odds that you're just not willing to take, then I would encourage you not to take a DNA test. If that's something that freaks you out to think about, then DNA testing might not be in your best interest. But if you are somebody who would be super curious and interested to find any of that out, then maybe you are more comfortable taking a DNA test. When we consider to continue to think about some of these ethical considerations, what will you do if you have a family member who won't take a DNA test? I mentioned that I've had my mom take a DNA test. I've had my dad take one. I've had my sister take one. But my brother has said that he does not want to take a DNA test. And what is my ethical response to that? Should I continue to hound him and try to get him to take a DNA test? Or do I understand that no means no? And he has said he doesn't want to take a DNA test. What are the ethical considerations for testing a minor child? Do you think that that's ethical to ask a minor child to take a DNA test? This does happen. There are people who have adopted children from other countries and they have their minor children take a DNA test in the hopes of being able to find the biological parents from that country. And I would ask whether that's ethical because did that minor give informed consent? Can a minor child give informed consent? What about an incompetent adult? What if we have an adult who has Down syndrome who's not able to make informed consent? Is it ethical? to have that person take a DNA test. Currently in genealogical circles, specifically as it relates to DNA, it is the opinion of professionals that only those who are able to give informed consent should be taking a DNA test. But there are also others who say that a parent and a guardian has the right to test whomever they're taking care of, even if that person can't give informed consent. And it isn't my job to say that one side is correct and the other one is not. It's just my job to present this as a scenario to you. What are the ethical considerations for testing somebody who has recently died while they're at the funeral home? This is a possibility if there is a recently deceased individual who is at a funeral home. As long as that person has not yet been embalmed, it is possible to take a cheek swab from them and have that cheek swab sample sent in for DNA testing, but is that ethical? I've been teaching genealogy classes for almost 25 years, I guess, and I had one of my students call me in a panic one time and say, my grandma died, she's at the funeral home, she always told me that she was going to take a DNA test, but she died before she could take it, what do I do? And I asked her if she really felt okay about having the funeral home do the, the cheek swab before they embalmed her, then that would be ethical if her grandmother really did say that that was okay. But what if an opposite scenario was true? What if somebody like my brother who has said, no, he doesn't want to take a DNA test. If he dies and he's at the funeral home, is it ethical for me to ask the funeral home to take a cheek swab of his DNA before they've embalmed him? That wouldn't be ethical because when he was alive, he said no, and we should respect that also when he's gone. When we take these DNA tests, the hard science are the matches, the people that we match with. I've shared with you some screenshots of what that looks like with Ancestry.com. Sometimes we will find that we have a close family match that we've never heard of. And we might reach out to them through the company that we've done the testing with, and they might not respond back. And what is the ethical consideration for dealing with that? If they use a username on Ancestry that's fairly unique, could we try Googling their username to see if maybe we can find an email address for them or a phone number? 
What about looking for them on social media? I'm really, really good at finding just about anybody on social media. And if they showed up as a DNA match to me and they're not responding to my attempts to connect, is it ethical for me to find them on social media and post something that all of their friends and family might see? That wouldn't be very ethical. There are also a bunch of free people search websites out there that we can use. In fact, I was using them today to do some genealogy research. I use these because they will tell me when somebody was born, some of their close family members, and I can use it for genealogy. But would it be ethical to use that to get a hold of somebody who's not responding when we've tested with them? It does seem like a pretty clear cut answer would be that no, if they're not responding, we really shouldn't reach out to them. But then I would remind you that a lot of people are given DNA tests for Christmas. That's a very popular time for people to open up their gifts and have DNA tests. And then the person who gave them the DNA test is managing the results and they may not be looking at their ancestry.com account. They may not know that you're trying to respond to them, that you're trying to get them to respond to you. So would it be ethical to do these other means? I think that as long as you can do something privately so that other family and friends of that person aren't also being aware of it, that it would be okay to do once. But if someone came back with, I'm not interested in connecting with you, then we need to respect that. Another ethical consideration is what is the level of privacy that is owed to our ancestors? And do all of your currently living relatives agree with that? If there was someone in your family, let's say that you had a grandparent or a great grandparent that had a child out of wedlock. And if we think about the times that that happened in, that would have been considered shameful. There would have been a lot of fear that that could, secret could have been found out. Do you or your currently living relatives say they suffered from shame, living in fear that their secret will be discovered, so I'm going to keep their secret out of love and respect? Or do you think otherwise? Do you say to yourself, you know what? I don't buy into that shame. That isn't a legitimate kind of shame. When we have shame like that, that needlessly oppresses people, and I don't buy into that. And I would ask how you think about this, and then what about your other living relatives? Do you share the same thought? Because if one of you takes a DNA test, those secrets will come out. Even if another currently living relative says, no, I'm not going to take the test. If one person has, the secrets do come out. When we think about secrets, are you going to disclose a secret if the people that it concerns are still living? I have in my own family uh, an ethical dilemma that came up with regards to DNA testing. I asked a bunch of my first cousins to take a DNA test. And through the course of taking those DNA tests, there were a couple of them who, just, who figured out that their parent is not their biological parent. And that secret would never have come out if they hadn't taken a DNA test. And so then they struggled with whether or not to tell their parent that they weren't biologically related. Do they disclose the secret or do they just keep the secret to themselves while those people are still living? A lot of times people will make the decision based on what they think the level of hurt might be. If you had a grandparent who had a child out of wedlock and that grandparent is no longer living, would it be okay if you tell the rest of the family that that came out from DNA testing because the grandparent's no longer living? And then finally, when we think about ethics of DNA testing, I would encourage all of us to stop making the jokes that seem to be pretty popular where we find out that there's an unexpected parental event and somebody says something like, mama was friendly with the milkman or mama was friendly with the mailman. I think that we need to refrain from making jokes like that because unless we were actually physically present at the moment of conception, we don't know whether that conception happened with consent or if it was non-consent. We don't know that. 
When this happens, when we have an event that is called a misattributed parentage, sometimes called an NPE, not the parent expected, we want to remember that it could have been because there was an adoption and nobody wanted to admit that it was an adoption. They tried to pass a child off as a biological child. We want to remember that it could have been a step parent. Maybe the step parent married the other parent when the child was very young and raised the child to believe that they were a biological parent. We know that there were instances where people would use donor conception to get pregnant. It is true that there have been instances of infidelity, but it's also true that there have been instances of rape that have resulted in a misattributed parentage. Even less likely, but still possible, there have been instances where babies were switched at birth. So when we take these DNA tests and we discover these kinds of things, I again will encourage people not to make the joke about mama being friendly with the milkman, because again, unless we were physically present, we do not know what the circumstance actually was. It could have been any of these instances here. I said that we were gonna end the presentation by doing a very, very brief introduction to GEDmatch and that is that third party tool. It is not a company that sells DNA tests. It's a company that people will use to upload their results from another company. And they do that as a way to try to target as many testers as possible. If I took a test with Ancestry.com and somebody else took a test with MyHeritage and somebody else took a test with Living DNA, all three of us can upload our results to GEDmatch and connect with one another if we're related, even if we took tests from three different companies. That makes GEDmatch something called a crowdsourced database. There are currently 1.45 million users who have uploaded their DNA to GEDmatch. And I do want to remind you again that law enforcement can access everybody's data when they're trying to identify human remains. When we have an instance where they call somebody a John Doe or a Jane Doe, law enforcement is allowed to look at everybody's data at GEDmatch to try to identify who that John Doe or that Jane Doe is. Law enforcement is also allowed to look at the data of anybody who gives consent when they're trying to identify perpetrators of violent crime, but you do have to consent to that when you sign up for GEDmatch. Included on your handout are some links, including a link to a Facebook group for GEDmatch if you want to learn more about it. And then I've also included a bunch of other resources on your handout. I've put some of the best books that are available for doing further research into genetic genealogy, some of the most popular blogs that people are reading to stay up to date. I've also included some webinars that you could watch. And I would encourage you to look through those if you have additional questions that I didn't cover, because again, this was an introduction to genetic genealogy or using DNA tests, DNA tests to discover family history. You'll remember that at the start of our presentation, I gave you a list of objectives, and I want to make sure that we hit those objectives while we were together. I said that our first objective was to talk about the basic principles of genetic inheritance, and we did that. That's also included on your handout. I said that we would then look at the three different DNA tests that were available, and we did do that. We looked at why DNA tests that only men can take, mitochondrial DNA tests that can be taken by men or women and then autosomal DNA tests that could be taken by men or women. And then on your handout, you have the information about the companies that offer them. Basically, Family Tree DNA is the only company right now that offers Y DNA testing and mitochondrial DNA testing. Our third objective was to spend time talking about the myths and the ethics of DNA testing, and I'm confident that we have done that. And then finally, we close the presentation by talking about GEDmatch, the third-party tool. It does not sell DNA tests, but it allows people to upload the results of their DNA test in the hopes of matching more users. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in just a moment, but I do want to let you know that if you come up with a question after this presentation is over and you want to reach me, you can find me on my website, socialmediagenealogy.com. There is a contact me button that you can send your question. And I love getting questions about genealogy. That's usually the first thing I do every morning is look to see if anybody has sent questions because a day that starts with genealogy is gonna be a fantastic day, no matter what. 
and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now.